feels so natural that we have to deal with my mother when <coughs> just passed away. And I was so fascinated. I mean, she made it sound so natural. She said, okay, but I'll take care of that and I'll do, 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 do. And in a very, very respectful way. And then I had to call her again and say, hey, hold the horses. My father is coming that way too. And she was, she said things that I've never even thought about. She said, okay, now she really listened to me. She sat down and listened, not too much, not trying to oversell, not trying to push, <coughs> not trying to take over and said how she wanted it to be. Very much more listening to how I wanted and to how my parents' life has have been together. And she said, have you ever thought about have, having them in, in a double urn? I said, double? Yes. We can, we can make that, we can, we can create that. Fine, that works, that's good. That's exactly how they want it to be. Do I speak, uh, can you hear what I'm saying? Good. Um, and that was when she, you know, then my, my aunt, she died six weeks later. Oh. Yeah, okay, so I had a lot of experience being mm -hmm. the one who's left behind. Mm -hmm. Had a lot of experience talking to funeral directors, a lot of, experience for that part of research. But I was so curious about her work and the way that she handled it because she made it feel so natural. And she put so much dignity into it. So I didn't even think that it was, I feel sorrow, I was sad, I was in the middle of it. But at the same time, I felt that she was like grabbing me like this and take care of me. And I knew when she left after the third funeral, I had to write about a funeral director. I have to have a female funeral director. And then the story starts snoring in my head. I mean, I was in the middle of a Louise Rick novel. So I had to put it down. I had to have my full focus on another, another very interesting woman. But it keeps coming up. And I knew that I wanted to write about relations and family relations and all the things that have never been said because one of the things that I found out when I when uh, after my parents passed away it was I was so maybe not just lucky but it meant so much to me that we have spoken about everything I have asked at that time I did not know maybe 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 you you know that but I did not know how big a taboo it is to talk about death. I didn't know that. For me it was natural because we have, we have talked about it. And we have talked about it in periods where it wasn't weird. My, I knew that they had put down words, what music they want to play and it was, it was so crazy. They have, what do you call it, these tapes that we put music on, not, not DVD but on music, uh, cassettes, C even, not, yeah, even older. Cassettes. Cassettes, cassettes, yeah, exactly. Track. Yeah, <laughs> they, it was. I mean, my my mom put down a very elegant uh, <laughs> classic uh, music number, and my father was. He, it was more like a Russian march. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and then I couldn't hardly find a place to to put these tapes in. I mean, where do we find a cassette uh, player. player anymore? So I had a very hard time, but I succeeded. And, it was so fun because it was like they okay now we have them here so they have been they have been thinking about everything and that makes it so much easier for me but starting up uh, on this new story it was like what if you don't have the chance to talk about death with with your uh, beloved one so you don't know what they want and how they want it and no one uh, no one wants to die so that is probably one of the reasons that we're not talking about it but it was so interesting uh, because a, a full story popped up in my head. Normally I start every story of doing a lot of research, a lot of police research, because that uh, it, it, my earlier books is police procedures. But this time it was like it, it took over and start, what if, duk, 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 what if a father left her family, his family 33 years ago? What if he never ever reached back to his daughter, even that she tried to reach out to him? It was very much 
about all the things that we never said, all the things that we never talked about. So my protagonist, Ilka, which is a very weird name. It's, it isn't a, you could maybe think it's a Danish name. It's not. She's named after a horse. Sorry. <laughs> could be worse. Could be worse. But Ilka Nichols is a horse who won the derby <coughs> on the horse track. The first time her father was with his father, the name could be very, very much worse. Could be puppy, whatever. It could be so weird. No, but he, Ilka's father, Paul, he went with his father to the horse track race. And the first time they went there together, the derby winner was Ilka Nichols. And that memory meant, it meant so much to him, having that relation with his father, being there with his father. So when he got a daughter, he named her Ilka. Not fair. Absolutely not fair. Okay. But Paul took his daughter, Ilka, to the horse track. So you already see where we're going. It's in the, it runs in the family. And she had this thing with, with her father. They went there together. That was the moment they had together. That was when, when they're going alone without the mom to the horse track race. And one day, her father wins big money out there, and almost the next day he disappeared, out of the, out in the blue. I mean, not a word, not an explanation, nothing. And she'll have tons of questions, of course. What happened? Why did you just disappear? In all these years, she's trying. Thirty-three years, she's trying. She finds him. She's trying to reach out to him. She knows that he lives in Brazil. And here it comes. Why? Why, Rasin? <laughs> because I try to set the story in Denmark to begin with. I try. You know, it will never, ever take 33 years to find someone in Denmark. <laughs> Sorry to say it's not possible. It is not possible. Even where I put them, 33 years, no, no we will find them. We will track them down in some way. So my idea, of course, was <coughs> to really move him away. So she couldn't get a chance just to find him. Because it is, the big question is, what if you cannot ask all these questions that I ask my parents? What if you never ever have a chance to see what you come from and, and, and uh, recognize some of your own behavior because you see it in your parents or in the family? Ilka never ever got that chance be because her father left. And I find it so not unf so unfair. And she, in all these years, reached out to him and never, ever heard a word back until he's dead. And they reached out to her because they wanted her to come to Racine and to confirm that she is Paul Jensen's daughter. And she's not coming, she's not flying into Chicago and drive up to Racine to find out uh, that she had inherited a funeral home. She's coming because she hopes to find some answers. And the question about getting answers is very, I, I find that so interesting. I find secrets and all the things that have been hiding for so many years and the things that could have been so different if he didn't take that choice back then when he won all the money. All these things that has a big, big, big influence on the way our life will become because we take choices. I find that so interesting. And because I'm a crime, a crime writer, of course I can turn it up a bit, or I can slow it down a little bit. But when Ilke arrives here, it is very, for me, that is the very interesting thing, is to put her in a totally, for her, unknown community and to see the differences. Because I'm not, I'm not trying, just, just because I've not now set the story here in the US, I'm not trying to be an American uh, crime or suspense writer. I mean, you have so many, best one, great ones, so why should I? I'm trying to be a Danish 
right, is setting my story here with the Danish view on things. And that has been really, really interesting, very interesting. Before I start writing, I, I was uh, working, and now you can laugh, but it's true. I was uh, working as an intern in a funeral home in Denmark. That was, that was quite a bit. I've never, ever been into that business before. So, I mean, there were so many words that you have to deal with, so many things and so many decisions and so many ways to, of course, handle things. It, I was, uh, they took me in, the one who helped me with my three funerals, they took me and said, but Sarah, it's, it's not interesting at all. What, what, how, what can you come up with here? I mean, nothing is happening. I said, oh, you haven't seen nothing yet. <laughs> you haven't met me yet. <laughs> Everything can happen. <laughs> Because the setting is so interesting, I mean, of course, still, people in my books, we have a murder case, we are calling the police, but we're not solving, Ilka is not solving the case. She's in it, she's, everything is happening around her. But uh, I, 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 had a, I had an idea of how it would work in Denmark, because I mean, I've experienced this myself, but still it was, it was kind of weird for me to stand in and move a dead body. A dead body. I'm not used to that. It's still, eh, how weird is that? But in the same way, it was. It touched me a lot that it was so filled with respect and dignity. Because I could think, and I probably had think, thought before, that okay, it's a dead body. Have it done, over and out. Come on. No, 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 it is a person lying there. And I really like that. And that is one of the things that made me so interesting in that job and her profession. Because the whole way that she's handling the dead ones, as it's still a real person. I really like that. Yeah, exactly, personal. And then I came to Resin to do some research. First of all, to see the, the no, I chose Racine because, like, 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 you know, there are other Danish communities in the U.S. There is Solvang in California, mm -hmm. very much Frikadella or Ebleskiwa. Yeah. Yeah, very much, <laughs> as we say. And then there are Elkhorn. Mm -hmm. And I, in Denmark, we have a TV show uh, of two uh, chef cooking, and they have been and maybe it's 10 programs from uh, from Elkhorn. So I feel that they own Elkhorn. Move on. And a very close friend of mine talk, uh, told me about Racine because he, he lived here actually 22 years ago. And he said, no, it's much better before because it's a much more, um, what do you call it? Uh, it's not touristed in the Danish way. Mm -hmm. It's much more a real, Community. It's a real city. It's not. It has this uh, relations to Denmark. As they, the first thing I heard is that Racine, Wisconsin, is the place with the largest population of Danish people outside Greenland. And I like that. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, it's not like okay, we have <coughs> Danish flags and frigadilla. We have Kringle, though. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was much more of a real, a real, uh, a real town and not a tourist kind of trap where we see, oh, see, we're Danish. So that was one of the reasons that I found that this could be much more perfect for me because I want a regular, a normal setting, an everyday life set here. So I came and you can Google, we just, just, we just talked about Googling. I mean, journalists, authors, we're Googling a lot. And I found it so perfect that Lake Michigan, I mean, it's, the setting is perfect, it's beautiful. There is the harbor front, there is, everything is perfect. But it is always different when you come and visit. I came in and I was so surprised because I was, where are you people? Maybe it was in the afternoon. I was the, <laughs> there was no one on the street. I was like, hmm, what are they doing? <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> that is very interesting for an author to find out. And then I was so 
so lucky to um, to be very very warm welcomed in two different funeral homes here in the city and that probably have been the most important and most uh, valuable research I've ever done because there is a huge different from the undertaker business in Denmark to how it works here <coughs> a huge different we do not embalm people uh, only if we have to fly a body out of the country otherwise it's really it's not a, a common thing and if if we have to embalm a, a body then it has to be done at the forensic institute it's not a thing that you can do in a funeral home yeah we do not do open caskets there is so many things that are so different and to begin with and I can say that it, it was weird it was a little bit weird for me to walk in and see that like it like walking into a kind of a jewelry store where there was these charms mm -hmm. yeah and and the the funeral director showed said yeah this is for the if, if you want to carry the ashes here I was like, hmm, who wants that? <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then we go on, and it was so. I learned so many things. We do not have these kind of not sermons, but where we say goodbye, like in big, uh, in a big uh, open rooms with 100 people and an open casket. And he said to me, you know what? We try to be so close to the not just close in person to the to the the person who is not here anymore. But in the spirit of the person that our, uh, in, uh, in the spirit of our beloved ones, if they love dogs, then you can bring dogs. We have Harley Davidsons in here, he said. And that is so, it, it, will, it will be a very, very weird thought in Denmark, wouldn't you say? Bring in the Harley Davidson. He said, if, if the dead one, if, if he or she loved karaoke, then we will sing. We don't allow us allow sex and alcohol. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> but but I mean that take on it is very very different from Dane, from the Danish way we do it. And there was also the open thing about you can go and write your memories of of the of the dead ones and you. It is so much more. Hey, we love that person who's up here. Let us say goodbye in a proper way. And I really like that. And when I start do, talking to people and start doing research around the, uh, the funeral home, not just the business, but the way that people think about it, then I was, I think that we are much more distance, have a much more distance to the dead ones in Denmark. Because it's like, I'm not sure I want to see, the, but I'm not even sure that I want to go and say goodbye. And that is so interesting. And the way of handling death, it is super expensive here. It's not as expensive in Denmark. Yeah. But it, all these small details, for me, was so interesting. And the way that, uh, that I was invited in and showed everything, I think that has a big influence on, on how the book turns out. And you will recognize Racine. I've changed few places and I've of course changed and um, I've turned it up as I said <laughs> and sometimes I've turned it down but one of the things that I haven't touched is this total same level is when I came here the first night I was staying at the Harbour Front Hotel and there was that sound coming like a landline phone ringing oh, the I didn't know what it was. It came every time. And then I went out in the reception and asked a very nice woman in the reception, excuse me, what is that sound coming in? And then she just looked at me and said, what sound? <laughs> I said, oh! <laughs> no, but it has been so, so interesting because of the differences and because of all the Danish things going into the city here, I feel that I didn't know that it was a sister town to Olbo. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many things and I love it. 
And when I built up the first The Undertaker's Daughter, I knew that I want to set the scene here, take all the people who's not living here with me, tourists in, show them around, see what I see, use the area, the setting, some of the people and places, and get to know them. And then in book number two, we can turn it up and tell what actually happened when her father left and open up for all the secrets. I think that secrets is the thing that is so fascinated for me here and the choices that we made. Because we do take choices and, and some of them, they lead us in another direction. Don't you uh, often, uh, not often, but once in a while I think, what if I had done this instead of that? Where would I have been? Oh, there's so, it had not even need to be big things. It can be small things, people we meet mm -hmm. that could change our direction from here. But of course, there is an answer to why he had to leave. And of course, there is a reason that he could never ever uh, reach out to her again. But that is in book number two. <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, maybe I, I could, you, as you probably know already, I could talk for hours, but maybe you will have some questions about me or Racine or the book and why, and can I ever, ever walk down the main street in Racine after writing this book? I hope so. <laughs> but <laughs> of course it's, yeah, please. What, what month did you visit? Sorry? What month did you visit in? In May, in May. yes. Um, so I hadn't tried it cold as now, mm -hmm. and I have a one big issue, but I had found out what, how, when it's really cold, because that winter after I came, the winter before had been extremely cold. Uh, I was book touring and I was in Chicago in February, I That's think. not a nice time to be there. Gee, a lot of snow, <laughs> and it was so ice, ice, ice cold. I was like, how do you put the body in the mm -hmm. down? when it's so cool but we have machines to do that i know now <laughs> but i was here in, in may and it was beautiful yeah and the things that i haven't talked about or should talk about even things that is not in the book <laughs> yes please what what encouraged you to become a mystery writer my my own love for mysteries I've been, uh, I've been a reader all my life. Actually, uh, when I was a kid, uh, a child, I, I no, not just as I, I, I was a child, I had dyslexia. You probably wouldn't have guessed that. Anymore. Yeah, and uh, I was kind of introvert. So as a child, I love to jump into the, the mysteries. And there was a reason that it was mysteries and not anything, and, and, and not a lot of uh, other things. It was because of the the solving part of the of the book. Because when you when you're struggling with dyslexia, it's very much easier just to put the book away. But because I saw myself and I love I don't know if you know that, but in in Denmark it's very popular. It, it's called the famous five defem. It, it's four children and a dog solving mysteries. And I could be every of, of the children, or even the dog. I didn't care as long as I was one of the ones going out to an island and solve some mysteries. I love that and I think that jumping into a mystery where you need to find out what is happening and why and will they ever solve it and what comes up and oh, it's dangerous. That is a very, very good uh, uh, training for a dyslexic. So I loved it. and when the rest of my class or, and my friends, they jumped to more serious books, I was stuck with the mysteries. <laughs> and uh, in, in uh, 93, in the, in the early um, 90s, I, I started up my own publishing house, only publishing crime fiction, but translated American and English and UK uh, crime fiction, because I mean, then my job was to read crime novels, <laughs> eat popcorn, drink tea all day, and then driving around to 400 
book shops, bookstores in Denmark twice a year. That was the hard part. I never told them that I was coming because then they couldn't refuse me. Then they couldn't say, no, 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 we don't have time for you, small publisher. <laughs> so I've always been in love with, with this genre, but I've never, ever dreamt about becoming a writer. My father, he was a very well-known journalist in Denmark, and my grandfather was, and my uncle, and I mean, it runs in the family. Now it's, it's running in the family, my marketing department says, but no, the writing was the thing in our family, and that is not a great skill when you is dealing with the dyslexia. So in school, you know, when, when, when you have the, um, the sports day, one day a year, twice a year, everyone is in for sport. And I was super good at it. I could jump over. I don't know how high I was. Very, very, I, I think myself, very good at it. And they said, oh no, Sarah, you're the one who's doing the writing. I was like, no. I was, I was, I had a hard time writing to begin with, so, and I want to be out there having fun. And no, no, because of the journalist thing and your and skills in your family, you do that, and then the other ones can have fun. <laughs> oh, thank you. So I actually, I, I hated it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was never, I was never, I never ever dreamt about becoming a writer. And the reason that it turns out that I did was, I was working as a journalist for many years. Uh, in, for, in, in on a magazine and then later in television and sometimes it is so hectic and the deadline is coming up especially in the, in the production uh, company business people are so uh, yelling and shouting and pushing and I found out if I just start telling myself a story don't close the eyes then they can see that you're not listening mm -hmm. so just I come, come up with a story what if a Danish journalist was killed in the back of this blah, 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 blah. And I was so curious in that story, and it keep running in my head, and I start researching how could it be. It wasn't, I mean, it was literally just for me. I wasn't, it wasn't a book taking, <laughs> starting up, I thought. Until one day I was, uh, there was a thing that I, I couldn't find out how that would be if it was for real. So I, I wrote a totally old, old letter to the, the former uh, uh, head of the police department in Copenhagen, the homicide department, asking, saying, and it was totally not right, I say, oh, I'm working on a novel going on in your department, what if this happened? Duk, 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 duk. And what happened was that he called me the next day, and for me it could have been George Clooney calling me. I mean, <laughs> it was like, <laughs> <laughs> It was so weird, they were over day. He was just, I mean, he was on the news all the time. He was super smart. He solved the cruelest cases. He was just a hero. And he said, why don't you, that sounds so interesting. Why don't you come in for coffee? <laughs> <laughs> and in so that awesome. moment, okay, I was actually working on it. Because there is one thing as a journalist, you can never ever just take up people's time. I would never do that. I mean, it's so disrespectful. So I had to be very well prepared. And I, could you see me coming in at the, I mean, at his office, at the police headquarters, and then after not very good coffee and powder milk, and then just say, oh, I don't know about the book. It was, but thanks for coffee. I could never do that. It's not okay. So I knew that, okay, here we're actually talking about real stuff, the real head of, head of it, everything. So that was the beginning of, of my career as a, write, as a writer. And I knew, mm, because I had this publishing house myself, and I've been a publisher for five years, I knew that you will never ever made it with one book. It wasn't that I saw, wow, I will be an overnight success. Not at all, and I wasn't. I wasn't, it took a year, then I, I got the debut award for the first one. It has sold nothing, and then it's self a little bit more than nothing. Yeah. And then the second one, the second story came to me because uh, during the research for the first one, the forensic scientist told me something that makes me super curious and started up and I said, okay, I need to write that story because it's a very interesting story. <laughs> and that is 11 books ago <laughs> or so. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't plan it, but I love it. Yes, please. What about doing uh, children's 
mystery book? Have you thought about it? Yeah, I have actually thought about it, and I have something coming. I'm a little too brutal, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I have thought about it. But uh, but the market is changing so much, and I mean, also, I think that I will be much more into kind of writing these mysteries that I loved myself as a child, and I think that. I, I'm afraid that they will find it too boring now that they go on Netflix and everything. Everything has been changing so much. So, I'm not sure. It's not the triplets anymore. It isn't. It isn't. No. I have some of those. Yeah, you have that? That I gave some to my grandchildren. Yeah. I buy them here. I, I love these old mysteries. I try to, I, when, when my son, now he's 20, he's not that much. Now he, he's reading Your Nesbu. And mine, Me too. sometimes. <laughs> but uh, but I'm, I was trying to convince him that we love mysteries. Oh, you do, he said. <laughs> yes, I do. But if he's reading John Nesper, he loves mysteries too. I'm reading, almost done with uh, the cockroaches. The oh, yeah, yeah. And there's something that I haven't talked about. I feel that I've pushed everything out on you. And um, one of the, one of the, I, I won't say one of the things that have been most interesting for me to normally when I set up a novel it's places that I know very well I mean it's places that I know how it feels to walk down this street and I know the stores around the corner I know I know know the setting so when I start writing it's like a movie is starting in my head and I'm actually just a kind of person who my fingers is doing the job it's very much about prepare myself so much so I don't have to go in and out of the story. I do a lot of research. I do a lot of preparing. I actually start, I didn't do that for the first six books, but now I'm plotting out a book. So I know where to go and where to say, ah, isn't that a little bit boring? Isn't, don't you have to find out that something more is going to happen here? Hey, you totally forget that person. You have to throw that person into the story again. So I'm very well prepared when I start my writing. And as I said, normally it's places that I really know. But because I've been here, I've been here actually twice. I've taken a lot of pictures. I've been in and out a lot of stores. I've been listening to what people say, sorry. It wasn't you. It wasn't you. Um, I had the feeling that I know my, not your, not, not the real resin, but my resin is so clear in my head because I have plotted it out. I have all these pictures. But it's still not like walking around in Copenhagen or in Wales, a very small town where I come from. And I was, I was afraid that it wouldn't work. I was afraid that it wouldn't be as clear to me and that the story will be much more constructed because I had to plan more. Because that is one of the things with, uh, with research, when, I, when I'm doing all the research, it's, it's for me, it's uh, after my research, I put it away and then I feel that I know the setting and I know what to come up with. And then my totally uh, crazy imagination can come up with the story and I'm just following. But I was afraid that it wouldn't work because this is not my setting. So would it be too constructive? <coughs> would it be, did I have to do too much of things that actually didn't work? But I didn't have the feeling at all. I had a very clear picture so when I draw in this evening, it was like, oh yes, there, here we go, and there, oh, mm, that restaurant, oh, I use it still, but I mean, it was, it was a base that I really feel that I could walk around in, and that is interesting for a foreign, uh, a foreign uh, rider. Yes, please. So how long were you here, the, the two times you were? Just a week, each time, yeah. I was thinking about mo moving here for a month or so, mm -hmm. but I think at the same time that my, I'm not, I'm very much trying to keep the Danish into my protagonist mm -hmm. and not doing her too American. I moved actually uh, a year ago, I moved to New York, so I'm living in New York now, uh, and that was a part of this. And there are so many things, I, this is so crazy, but the first time when I went down to, uh, to my grocery store, I was actually to Target across the street, and I was buying, I am from Denmark, I was buying beer, 
<laughs> and they said, they said at the counter, uh, can I please see your ID? I'm so sorry. And I said, oh, thank you so <laughs> much. In Denmark, you have to be 18, and otherwise, no one. <laughs> I don't think that they will think I'm younger than 21. So I was like, <laughs> thank you. Have a good day to you. And you know, and he he wasn't kidding. <laughs> he was like, really? Serious? Yes, please. It wasn't, it wasn't funny. I find that so funny. And all these small things, it's just interesting. So it, I think it has been helpful. But most of all, I am so excited to hear if you like my story. I really hope you do. And be aware, it's not, we are not solving murder cases. It's much more in, in the character-driven storylines. And two more will come, and I hope <laughs> that you will like the way that I drawn the picture of Rosine. It has really been a pleasure for me uh, to use your city. Thank you so much. <laughs> Not that I asked you before, <laughs> but now that I've done it. <laughs> it's been so much fun and people have been so friendly and open and helpful and yeah. It's really a pleasure. I hope you will like the story. If there is anything at all you would like to ask me about, then please do. Otherwise, I'll yes, yes, one more question. Yes, please. How do you title your books? Do they just, the title come to you first, and then, or when you start the story, or is it something like? Um, that is one of my favorite questions. It's a great, great question, and very hard to answer. <laughs> I know from the beginning of this book that it was the Undertaker's daughter. In Danish, it's called yeah, it's the same title, but Bidmanden's daughter. I knew that from the beginning. And there is a double thing in that title, because this is not just about a daughter whose father is an undertaker. It's very much about a daughter who has some of the same skills in her that her father. So it's a double, kind of a double title, saying she is the daughter of an undertaker, but she's also very much the Undertaker's daughter. I mean, there is so many things in her <coughs> that is a family thing from her father. And because he wasn't, it's actually a good thing that I can talk about that too, because he wasn't there, she never knew that she had some of the same skills as he had. So it's a double thing. And if, she, if, she, if he had been there, then she knew that she wasn't totally alone in these matters, because of course there is some of the things from Paul that she had inherited, not just a funeral home, but some difficult things to deal with. And that's not easy, and it will not help her, just saying, it will not help her. And the same actually in book number two that is out in Denmark now. I don't know exactly if you can, if you can translate it like this, but it's called Ilkes Inher Inherit. Inheritance. Inheritance. Inheritance, yes. Yeah. And in Danish, that means just that, okay, I can inherit inheritance a sofa or a funeral home, but it's also, so, yeah, how would you say that? It's also yeah. what I have. Your nature, your nature, your, 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 what you get from your parents. Yeah. Is, you, your nature. Yeah, exactly. So I don't in, know if that's the right American word. But in, da in <laughs> Danish, uh, the word means both. It does here too. It does, yeah. 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 What would you then say, Ilkes? Inheritance. Inheritance, yeah. 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 So it, it's both what you have from your parents yeah. and what you yeah. physically, physically have. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And I, I didn't think much about that when um, I had no title for book number two. And I had a lot of ideas and they just didn't work. And when this, I, when I almost finished, maybe I was two thirds in it or something like that, I knew that that was the title. And at that time, I found out, okay, it has the two sides of the title too. And now, I'm t I have no idea of title number three. And I, I'm not sure, what if I cannot do it, then I'll just call it Ilke. <laughs> I, mean, it ha I had to come up with something that is a double thing because I like that it, it is her story. Mm -hmm. And it's the story about her and her father and what happened back then and what they are dealing with now, because I have this m kind of a mantra for the whole series saying, and I, it works better in Danish, but you will help me. It says, 
Nothing is that bad that it cannot get worse. <laughs> worse. Yes. Oh yes, just wait and see. It can be. <laughs> and I like that because you, you can push, push, push. And then say, oh no, 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 no. Oh yes, push. Yeah. Yeah. But not in how much blood can we put on the pages. It's not like in that direction. It's much more, oh no, don't do that. Of course you will. <laughs> but titles is, when I worked as a journalist, I loved when I could start writing an article knowing what the headline would be. I mean, it's much more, it's much easier when you know exact angle, bang, go down. And having no title for a book, I mean, it can go in any directions. I wish, I love when I had the title. It makes me more unsecure and on shaky ground when I don't. But maybe that is good. Maybe it's good to be out on shaky ground when I start writing a book. <laughs> yes, please. Now your English is very good, but I see here that this actually was translated oh, yeah. by someone else. Is, is that to kind of help you keep your Danish perspective? You are so sweet. Thank you so much for the compliment. I could never, ever, ever write it in English. <laughs> never, ever. I mean, I actually, the, the thing with translations is, it is so important. My early series, uh, as we just talked about in the beginning, uh, in the Louis Rick series, is actually all of them, almost all of them, being retranslated because the translation, first time they went out, it wasn't good enough. We think it wasn't good enough. I want to tell you a story about translations. When my books now are, and it sounds crazy, they're out in 37 countries. Hmm. It's really crazy. And one of the big markets is Germany. And I was, uh, I had, I think, two or three books out in Germany and was invited, I've been touring in Germany, I was invited to speak at the university in Berlin. I was very much, very dressed up and, and nervous. And then before I entered the States, there was tons of people, two to 300 people or something like that. A Danish woman working at the university came up to me and said, Sarah, I just want to tell you that the, our professor here just ask me if it's you who are writing so poorly or if it's the translation. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, 200 people. And she said, and then, thank God, she said, but I told him that it's not you because I know your book's in Danish. <laughs> that was not good. That was not good. So we skipped working with that. Uh, but what, I mean, my books are out in South Korea and, 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 and Japanese, I mean, I cannot check that. Bulgarian, I, I have no idea. But here in the US, now I have a very great translator and, and even a very, very good uh, editor. But in between, I have a book doctor. Have you ever heard about that? Yeah, because I haven't, I mean, in all these translations I've been working with, I've never ever heard about book doctoring. And that means when I, when we send the translation, to my editor, uh, normally I would, uh, totally like, like it is in Denmark, I'll get it back with lots of comments, small things and words changing and commas, whatever it might be. And then I can do it because it's my first language. Mm -hmm. And then we go back and forth with this uh, manuscript. But here, I mean, I can see that she said, oh, said another word here, out with this. But my language isn't close to being good enough to do this kind of translation. So I'm sitting with this book doctor now, I've been working with her for a long time. So we, she knows my, my way to put things and she knows my personality. There is things that probably I could, I could swear a little less maybe, or I could be a little more not naughty or whatever it might be. <laughs> but she knows me and she knows that that is my voice and we want to keep that voice in my books. I want to keep that voice. But she can go in and do all the edits. So she is me together with me, but it's in her first language. I think that that makes a big difference. And I think in this market here, it's so hard. How hard is, is it? Is it three or 5% of book published in the US that is translated? I think it's like, it's something it's like tiny. that. It is, isn't it? It is, I think it's, it's a very, 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 very percent, uh, small percent that's translated. So coming into this market is, Amazing in so many in so many ways, but but taking the the translation serious is one of the things that can help. So we are 
going through all the books with her now. It's, it's very, very interesting and different. How did you find your current translator? It was my publisher. Um, and no, the first translator I had was my publisher. I was with another publisher to begin with. And this time, we, we took in samples and we give them a part of the book saying, okay, try to translate 20 pages or so. And it was a tough uh, decision saying, okay, you're the one here, you can do it. And we had another one, not that I like to talk bad about, but, but it wasn't just good enough. It wasn't good enough. Uh, and being, taking it very serious was, was the way in. And of course, when you, when you know book, when, if you have been reading some books and said, this works, they are very good at it, then go for them. There are, of course, a couple of names that is very popular. And then trying to find some who, who have the time to work with. Here it was nine, 10, 11 books. So many, so many books I've read that are translated from Danish makes it sound like such a simplistic language, but I know it's a musical language. Yeah. And that is hard to get across. To it, Americans. Yeah. But it's it's also not yeah, I mean it's one thing is to translate the, the words. Yes, the, 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 the what it's what's going on. Where they're going from A to B, okay, do it in so many different ways. But the voice that you want mm -hmm. it to being uh, the humor of oh, yeah. sarcasm, yeah. All these things are very often lost yeah. in some way because it's different. I mean we different uh, Countries have different kind uh, ways to being sarcastic, sarcastic or yeah. being funny or being naughty or being whatever it might take in different ways. Yeah. And something just some of it just don't work in translations. Yes, please. When you went and talked in Germany, do you speak German? Or <coughs> not at all. So how do you give a talk? It is so weird, mm -hmm. so weird. Because you enter the stage, and then, and then there is an actor, a professional actress, and she is reading out your book for 45 minutes when you are sitting beside her, looking out in the room over these 200, 300 people, not knowing where to put your eyes. That is so, so weird. And it's a very, it, that's the way it works in, in Germany. When author goes on tour, it's like, okay, you have these, it's not even a moderator. I mean, we're not in a conversation or anything. It's just her reading up my story. <laughs> when I'm sitting beside her, looking <laughs> around. <laughs> no questions? At, at the end, there can come some questions and it will all be translated. But the weirdest thing I've ever tried in that context is going on a, going on a, a morning show in Hungary, hun Hungary, Hungary, yeah, Hungary, with a a, 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 a translator, a, yeah, a translator, yeah, in between me and the and the host, yeah. and she was, a, I mean, it, we were we were on air live, and she was very beautiful and very famous, and it was super obvious that he was flirting with her. <laughs> <laughs> and I have not a clue of what they were saying. I mean, it was so embarrassing. Sh they were kind of having a conversation going on and I was like, she was asking a question through him, but it never turned out to, to, to reach me. And he was flirting. And I don't know what was going on. That was so weird. Oh. Yeah. Fun, fun on the fun road. On <laughs> <laughs> you can also sometimes, when you see these translations of the book, in some countries the, a book can have this size. The, totally the same book can la look like this in other countries. What, what, do, what did you cut out? <laughs> what, are we do, what are we doing? Wow. Yeah. yeah. How long do you spend, how many months or weeks or whatever, published or years. going around and touring with a book? I'm, over the years I've, I've learned to say no. I'm not touring as much now that I did before because I mean I take it very serious. The, the periods where I'm writing is like closed down, blocked out of my calendar because one of the things that is so dangerous when you're publi published so many places is that you are so it's so flattering when they say, "Oh, please come visit and we will fly you in." And but at the end of the of the year, don't have any writing time left. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I mean. That is the reason that we're here, 
it's because I love to write. So mm -hmm. I'm, I think that is, that is, a, that's the most difficult thing to say no to all these invitations and still come around and, pop, uh, and, and talk about the books. So I'm trying to be, this, this spring I will be in south of Europe, I will be doing Italy, Portugal and Greece. But I'll be touring a lot here in the US uh, over the spring also, but then I have long periods of writing. And that's not just because I, I need to deliver a book, it's because I want my God, I'm so curious because I have plotted this story out and I know what I will bring Ilka through and Rosin. I need to see it done because what? Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's who you are. Yeah, exactly. That's who I am. Yeah. And I'm so curious. Things will get worse. <laughs> Just worse. saying. Worse. Just saying. <laughs> it's not an easy ride. <laughs> We have two, two other strong characters in the book, Artie, who is working at the funeral home, and a sister. I, this is the, my final words to I promise, but this sister is taken directly out of a funeral home here in Brazil. When I was doing my research, I came in and I had this tour around, and behind a very, very beautiful big uh, desk, there was a nun, a sister. And, uh, and the woman who showed me around made the presentation say, this is sister, but we call her the laminator because she's laminating these um, yeah. uh, when, when it's in the paper that someone has passed away. Obituary. What is it called? Obituary. Obituary, yeah. And then you can use it as a, as a bookmark after. Yeah. Yeah. That was probably the most fun thing I've heard for a very long time. <laughs> What? <laughs> we call her the laminator. <laughs> and I've never ever heard about using this as a bookmark. So I've learned so much. And it's of course in the book because it's a <laughs> gift. That is one of the gifts, some of the gold that you have when you're out there talking to people. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you so much for being here on my publication day. And it means so much to me that I got an invitation to Racine. Thank you so much for hosting me. Really, it's a, I couldn't be in a better place a day like this. I mean, I've been waiting for so long for the book to come out here. Now it's been published in Denmark for more than a year ago. So having it out here is very, very special for me. I hope that you will like the story. If you have any questions at all, you can reach, you can write me. I'm on Facebook, we can get in touch. I'm open for questions, but I will not take more of your time now. I will, of course, sign books if you're up for that. We have all the books in the back and there's still something on the, some food and, and things. Yes. 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 Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me.